Hello everyone, welcome to my shop. I'm Robin and today we're going to be fixing this situation. This is a, a quarter inch diameter solid carbide boring bar with a coolant hole and uh, they use TDHB inserts, little teeny 532nds IC uh, inserts with 15 degree cutting angle because of such the small bore. Um, these inserts work really good. This bar worked reasonably well for a while. But the uh, head fell off, and uh, as you can see here, the taper that they have on this is not is way too steep. It's not giving enough uh, bond area. And I actually saw some reviews where people said the same thing. It works okay until the head falls off. So I'm not going to repeat that, especially since the bar alone now is uh, roughly in the $260 range just for the bar. Um, no, I cannot make replacement heads uh, one of for that price. But I'm going to make six of them because this is a handy little bar and uh, kind of a fun project. And the quality of these wasn't all that impressive to begin with. This, I Actually, the first one I got, the seat bottom was so non-flat that it actually cracked the inserts when you tightened it. So, um, yeah, it just lost my appetite for buying more of them. So I'm going to show you the process and design details of how I go about uh, making these. And obviously since I'm making uh, some extra heads, I'll probably do up a, another solid bar uh, without the through coolant um, as having a spare on hand. Here we have the cross section of the head. You'll notice I've got this conical, much shallower conical seat. I originally had this designed to 15 degrees, but I happened to have a D-bit cutter to do this plunge this taper that's at 22 and a half so I just moved it to 22 and a half idea here just be getting a more um, engagement that's getting closer to cylindrical than a flat face uh, also the having a thinner wall thickness here to be able to have the heat get in from the outside and to the bar quickly because we're trying to not anneal this head in the process now we're moving on to all the other features that we have to do in here. We've got the big cutout here, which has a three degree back taper matching the back taper of the bottom of the seat. The whole insert sits at a five degree front uh, clearance. And we have a hole here to uh, not need ultra small cutters to get in to do these tapers, uh, the tapered walls and the clearance and uh 256 tapped hole uh which is the the standard insert size we have our f uh five degree front clearance from here down we don't want to follow the uh 15 degrees of the insert all the way down because when we come back here we'll see that if we did this wall would get very thin where almost the, the threads would start to pop out through this so you do need some clearance on the front, but not the full 15 degrees, which is pretty steep. Um, and actually, because of the 3 degree tilt here, the effective front clearance is only 12 degrees. So this 5 degrees is a good compromise. Uh, you, you can feed fast enough, in theory, where this would start to rub in, but not with the finishing insert style of turning that we're going to be doing with this. One of the key things that I want to point out here and what I'm doing and what I'm going to be showing is this has a lot of different uh, operations. Drill, tap, roughing out the pocket, milling the pocket wall, putting this in, putting this relief in, front clearance, all these things. And um, with a, a machine without a tool changer or even uh, if you had a tool changer, um, it's just a lot, of, a lot of work where on my machine... Um, if I'm doing multiples, I need to come up with a way to put this part in and out of the machine in whatever uh, orientation it's in, whatever setup it's in, multiple times and have it repeat each time such that changing the part is a quick operation, but I can set up the tools, do whatever the setup is, and run that operation on all six pieces that I'm making. So I'm going to try to show you my train of thought here on how I came up with the method to make this uh, mountable uh, accurately, quickly, and not a big deal. Initially, I thought, okay, you could grab by, uh, you know, make this a little longer and grab with a collet, collet stop. But then you have to rotationally orient these somehow. And even if you put the uh, tab on the collet stop and something to reference on the part, 
you've got the play in the keyway of the collet that can bite you in the butt. Um, it's not perfectly rotationally aligned. So I'm going to show you here by opening up the sketch of this revolve to see what I did here. And you can see I'm using um, I'm using a lot of things on here just sketch-wise to do some math on the sketch, even though it doesn't have anything to do with the part. And what I thought is, you know what, let's put a tapped hole in the back of this and use a 10 millimeter set screw, M5 set screw, put five millimeters of engagement in the part, in this part, five millimeters of engagement in the mating mandrel. And I'll just add some dummy, you know, some excess material on the end here temporarily to give me the thread engagement I need. And that's what these lines are for. There's the OD of an M5 thread where it runs into my taper. This is where the tap drill size runs into the taper. And I literally I didn't even do a drawing. I just used these values and this overall length as my design drilled in this far for at the corner of the drill bit and then tapped them fully and um, designed you can see here I want these to be uh, some have some excess material on them I'm going to have them a 64th over a quarter when we're done before we solder so um, I made a 930 seconds um, hex and then I just used it to determine what the cross corners was on the hex so that's what we're doing. Um, just making this uh, uh, longer, putting a hex on here. I'll turn these, leaving a uh, place for the hex on here. But uh, you're all probably thinking, wait a minute, just a thread? That's going to be shaky. That's not going to repeat well. Well, um, it turns out that if I run a set screw into this hard, lock it up in here really hard, and then change that whole part as an assembly with, it, with this set screw, basically rigidly held in here as if it was an integral part of the the piece and run them in and out of the um, uh, the mandrel and the mandrel I'm using an a eight millimeter pull dowel which happens to have m5 threads in it and then I just hurt hard turn the end of it off so it has a good bearing surface so um, you'll see when I turn these and I check for the repeatability um, you run these in tighten them up mad tight final turn this to the my oversized diameter um, and try the repeatability it's very good so that that takes care of that aspect so that's how um, I'm making these able to go on and off of this or this mandrel and the mandrel can poke out enough from the collet face of my indexer such that my mill tools and things won't be crashing into the face of the uh, collet or the indexer getting to the all the orientations and, and places that I need to get so I thought I'd share um, how I go about making an insert uh, pocket uh, with a particular insert and the orientations and I find this way to be pretty helpful I'm not saying it's the best way but it, it works I start out by modeling the insert uh, what the relevant things that are important the uh, corner radius the clearance angles the thickness everything correct in this particular case because I wanted a five degree front clearance what I'm doing now on top of just modeling the insert is I am giving myself a way to locate and mate this insert into the uh, pocket head uh, as an assembly. Uh, so here's my inserts with the planes and what I've done is I've made this three degree top plane intersect this sketch line that was on the actual part and it be at three degrees. So if I mate this in my part uh, level I'll have my three degrees back clearance. And then I made a plane perpendicular to that through the same line that lets me uh, orient the part rotationally with that. And then we just have one more degree of freedom that we line up on the part, which in this case is going to be the back edge of this radius uh, tangent with the back edge of the quarter inch bar. So what I do is I bring in the part, the insert. You can just see the little tip of the insert poking through here. And I'm going to go to wireframe so you can see what's going on here. There's my insert that is in the part and I've mated the planes of the insert and added some mates here on the tangency on the back of the cylinder so that this um, is oriented properly and located in space relative to the part. Now I'll go back to uh, solid mode here. Now what's going to happen is I'm going to, I'm going to, it's in rollback state now and all of the features here what I've done is modeled using in context off the insert. So I've added some planes, some things, you'll see cut, cut extrude. Here's where I did the five degree face relative to this bottom edge. 
and then um, go here and get some more items in the there we go there's the main cutout that I'm doing basically flush with the top of the insert there's the actual insert pocket and you notice that this isn't isn't cleared out yet because the whole clearance hole isn't in the back yet there's the big upper relief that we did here and then um, we'll do that now we've got our relief hole and our tapped hole and so you can see by doing that by modeling all off that insert what happens now is if I change my mind and say oh I want six degrees I can go back back and edit the insert geometry and change the front angle or the the back rake angle the three degrees and everything will update in this part you can actually have different configurations for that so that's very helpful one other thing to keep in mind that uh, I may or may not be aware of with inserts is these threaded holes are actually offset into the pocket to pull the insert back in there they're not actually just centered because they have to put seating force in here and these values are not uh, something you can just calculate so um, I have about five thousandths of offset in here and I will drill and tap the holes first in that location and as uh, that everything will be done except this final mill of the the actual uh, tapered uh, walls of the pocket and what I can do is I can do them in my nominal location I can use my tool diameter offset to make these narrower and I'll actually check put an insert in check it see if it's too tight and I can just keep moving these walls out a little bit a little bit at a time until I get this right value once I do that on the first one then I can run them all with that amount and have just the right amount of, of seating force back into there and hitting at the bottom at the same time uh, there's just no way to calculate it I've talked to people who uh, maybe there are but the people I've talked to that make uh, insert tooling like this say no it's somewhat trial and error it has a lot to do with the clear thread clearances the you know the shape of the screws and all that so it's a real can of worms so that's um that's basically the modeling method I used to do this. I just thought that might be helpful to um be able to do it that way and then realize that all these things update. As you well know when you do 3D modeling like this, your sequence of events and things can make your life miserable or it can make it easy. And I think this is one where it makes it easy. This is actually a SolidWorks drawing of the pocket. And what I used this for was to design the uh, cutter parameters and where these hole locations would be for this relief hole uh, and what I've done here is I've said I'm making a 40 thousandths diameter tip on my custom uh, 15 degree angle cutter and I'm going to get this wall here this setback by just making a step in that same cutter which I'll show you when I when I do the cutter but by doing this, I can uh, right here. I'm clearing the sharp of the insert if it had a sharp tip on this back edge. Uh, but then I come up here and say, okay, up here to where the cutter has to to cut to, I'm going to uh, set that as my point that I need to be tangent to, and then this lets me know where uh, where the the location of this hole needs to be. So and the diameter. So working with those, I come up with these dimensions to say, okay, this is where it's gonna where it's gonna be. And this gives me a lot longer engaged length on these faces than the original seat. They put a much larger milled slot in here that took a lot of the uh, strength of the of the length of facet that that engages with the tool away. So just showing here using sketches to determine where that is. Here you can see I have modeled the cross section that I would revolve to design the D-bit cutter. We've got the 40 thousandths tip diameter here from our previous sketch. We've got our 15 degree angle to match the clearance that's on the insert. Then we've got our 5 thousandths radial step over. There's nothing critical about this. It's just a relief so that the edge of the insert comes here and does not get chipped by being pushed on by the seat in case the seat angle is a little bit uh, shallower it would tend to break the uh, break the insert edge so this is just below the the thickness of the insert so um, this is what I'm going to use to do my my d-bit grind and I'm actually going to add a dimension here that is this way this orientation 
so that I know how far to move from the tip in with my diamond wheel when I go to cut this and then back off to do the other or vice versa grind this outer one first and, and then grind this one to this depth and this can be smaller uh, needs to be 40,000 or smaller so this isn't critical uh, other than it changing the depth so I'll check those things out in the comparator I've added this dimension right here I've had this construction line to come out here and what that represents is the outside untouched corner of the cylindrical blank where I'm going to touch off on and then this is how much I'll move in the grinding wheel in feed direction 041 I'm going to make it 042 to make sure I'm below this to come into here and then this I'm going to back off the 5000s radially which will make this 037 in feed from there so I added these construction lines to be able to tell let me know without taking it out of the machine to go measure and trying to get set up again to get this uh, in the ballpark so it should be good first shot when we check in the comparator the material I'm using for these heads is Viscount 44, which is a pre-heat treated H13 tool steel. It does have a few additives to make it machine a little better at that 44 Rockwell uh, range, but uh, really good stuff. And it re it's a hot work steel, so it retains an immense amount of its strength and uh, hardness at elevated temperatures. So at uh, roughly 1000 degrees or so that you would think uh, for silver soldering, uh, maybe 1200, um, the levels are still very high, and you'll see that I'm going to use a heat sink to keep the actual pocket from getting anywhere near that temperature. So, um, just an excellent all around steel, extremely strong, um, you know, 200,000 psi uh, in its uh, at room temperature, um, and uh, the yield is uh, a minimum of 160,000. So, really, uh, really good stuff. Oh. The stop locks are pretty handy for relatively precise, repeatable positions going in. Facing this at C0 with this tool, and then turning it to 328 for 650 thousandths. Switching to my parting tool. File the edge. Parting tool and location. Part off a little bit. Stand for the back edge. And then part it off. Twenty-one sixty-fourths collet for that diameter that I just turned. Using collet wrench, handy item. Just snugging this up, so it can move. Always pays to think ahead to your next operation, and in this particular case, I'm going to be putting a hex on the end here, as I showed you. So I'm leaving enough out for that to happen, and be able to grab onto this as I put these parts in and out, drilling and tapping the hole. So always good to consider your next operation if you're using the same collet. Okay, now I'm facing these off. Each one, just popping them in and out of the collet, as I'll be doing all these operations, just in and out, this is a real quick way of uh, doing repetitive operations on the machine. One of the great advantages of collets in general is just that repeat, especially with a, a, style, a stop in there, and we're just getting these uniform. Now we're spot drilling in the end. Watching what I'm doing on my digital. Pop one out, stick another one in. That's the beauty of having the solid tool post and the repeatable position of the drill chuck. Now with the tap drill. Pop another piece in. Watching my depth position on my digital. 
Another rinse repeat. Now we're on to tapping. Now I'm taking a semi bottoming tap down in there to go down until I hit the bottom. Which doesn't take much because I got pretty close in the lathe. That's it. D bit grinder allows you to make really nice bottoming taps out of uh, taps that have lost their life for normal tapping. So I'm going down in here and I'm getting the final last nth degree of threads in there to run right into the bottom. We have the indexer set up in the mill and as I mentioned before we anticipated the collet, lo collet stop location for milling these off. So now we're going to mill the hexes on. I already have everything set height wise. This Harding indexer is really really nice that it's set for six divisions. That's it. A little more up close and personal. While I have the collet set up here, I'm using it to hold these still while I run the set screw into them, M5 by 10 set screw. And this set screw is going to stay put as we described through the process. It's just an easy way to hold them, keep them from spinning while you tighten the set screw up. So I have my CBN tool here that I'm going to just come back and face this off until I get back into the threads. That gives us a nice flat surface that's true. It's an 8mm dowel pin, already has the M5 threads in it. So I'm using this as my mandrel. So now we thread our pieces in, one at a time. Torque this up to the maximum seating torque here. Good and firm. Power on. We're turning this to 266 to match a 64th over a quarter collet because we'll be holding them on this diameter afterwards. Off. Low speed. Break the edge. We're going to loosen and retighten and check TIR. So we're checking there, and you can see that's plenty good run out as far as repeatability of position. That's why we did the threads first with oversize so that we could make it run true to the threads how they seat. I've shown my collet expansion technique for. Uh, import collets before but I'm not sure I've actually shown me doing it and this is my preferred location to actually do the uh, screwdriver because it's an area that has uh, you know doesn't matter if you if you mess it up <laughs> if you if you want to look at it that way uh, you can file this off and it's not a functional area and then once that's in you can just snip these off with the flush cutters you notice I'm sitting in aluminum soft jaws here and uh, tapping in here with a nice uh, tapered blade screwdriver makes it real easy using the 332nds, uh, preferably Viton uh, O-ring stock. Snap it in, push it down a little further, make sure it doesn't poke out the top. It won't matter, the collet will, the closer will, will uh, push it in if you don't. And in no time you're, you've got all three of them in without any struggle and um, without hurting the functional uh, aspects of the, of the collet. 
And you notice that if you put it in this way, I'm turning it 90 degrees so that the bend gets straightened out uh, in the, in the uh, groove. So I'm not fighting it going into a curve. Need a little bit more here. There we go. Uh, not fighting it going into a curve like that. It lets me put it in like that it's straight. Pop that out. Snip it off and you're good to go. Edge finders on the end and the sides of the piece to get on center and know where my lake location is. Same setup as before with the uh, indexer in the mill, but now we've changed the 8mm collet, put our 8mm pull dowel in that we used as our uh, arbor. And we're putting our parts in, threading them in, and we're tightening these mad tight. And this is our basically our repeatable parts position. And since we have a lot of different operations to do, this allows us to do per tool, since I don't have a tool changer on this machine, allows us to do per part, or per tool, every part. That's all for that. Take the part out. And then we'll take a look at this. Now you can see we've got our relief and we've got our three degrees back break on this. I'm holding a three degree block uh, against the base of the indexer and I'm tramming up with the head of the mill just to check my alignment, which is plenty good enough for what we're doing here. As you can see here, I'm just tilting the whole indexer in the vise, and I just use this three degree angle block on the base here for tramming purposes. So just, just as a double check, I'm tramming the surface that we just milled previously, which was milled on the three degree angle to make sure that this jives. So I'm up on the radius now, should come down to zero and then drop off at the end. There we are sitting, and then it'll drop off at the end. I come back, you'll see it climb up, hit zero, stay there on the flat, and then start to climb. So we're good. Just do Since I tilted the dividing head, or uh, indexing head, I need to re-edge find on the lip here for the axial position. The lateral position is still good because the flats on the indexer haven't moved relative to the vise. With real small end mills, it's always a good idea to indicate in. Make sure you got your flute, your flutes uh, at the, in the cutting zone, cutting on the exact same location. Uh, you can gently tap on here with a. I use an aluminum piece uh, like this and a uh, brass thunker, and just gently tap on. You, you can't move it miles, but if you're only out, you know, half thousandth or something, you can usually tap them in so they run nicely.
Here's with the pocket roughed out. Uh, next will be the 15 degree cutter. I'm going to grind up a D-bit. We're here in the D-bit grinder. We're going to uh, half this cutter to give it the cutting flute. I'm going to rough it with this uh, rough wheel and then put a 600 grit wheel in. And you're going to see this come into play with our doing our tip. Just a little note, this is my take on keeping uh, grinding wheels in shape. Grinding wheels will wear from the edge that you're taking the most material off. They're going to wear the most there and they're going to diminish to less wear as you trail off. So if you infeed here and then pull off this direction, as opposed to infeeding on the outside and diving in this way, which I see a lot of people doing, um, you'll keep this wheel shaped where this outermost edge cuts first and this cuts last. And what that does is it lets the arc of the, of the grinder generate your flat, not the shape of the wheel. As soon as this wheel wears where this outer edge is worn away more, you're not going to be able to generate a surface that is um, uh, flat, full length on this thing. It's going to have a taper that you can't get rid of because the sweep of the wheel um, can't get rid of it because the, there, there's no outer edge here to basically cut and, and generate true to the, to the move of the machine. So always good to keep that in mind. Same way with surface grinder wheels, um, it's going to the way you traverse across is going to leave an outer edge. So if you have to do sharp corners, it's always good to down feed at the corner and traverse off such that that outer corner stays sharp. So just a just a note. Pays to make a nice wrench. The most important part about this wrench is this extension, and all it is is an M5 that's been drilled and tapped into. Uh, the end of this M8 such that this goes down and hits in this in the tapped hole in the spindle hits at the bottom It doesn't have this hitting on the threads of the spindle that hold the uh, That hold the part on that hold the wheel on so th definitely worthwhile to make and you'll see this works really well Nothing I invented. It's just uh, Just showing you what matters here That quick, wheels off. My 600 grit wheel on. You just absolutely have to use hubs. It's just, especially with um, super abrasive wheels like this, it just doesn't make any sense to do it otherwise. Now I'm going to take the 600 grit wheel and I'm actually going to take this to size. I'm taking a break here and I'm measuring this and seeing how close I am to my 0625 thickness and now I know how much to take off. So I'm at uh, uh, 066. So we've got uh, what three and a half thousandths to come off the face there. So we'll go in and take that off. Here you can see that 600 grit wheel finish. Really nice. And uh, corner holds well. Here I'm setting my 15 degree angle of the actual cutter on this particular axis like this. Here I'm setting the actual cutting lip angle. In this direction. Here I'm doing the actual end cutting relief. So I've got my same 12 degrees that I'm going to use on the on the uh, side of the flute I'm using on the end and then I've also cocked this just a few degrees this way in this direction to make sure that the outer edge of the lip cuts and doesn't uh, gives me a flat bottom doesn't cut at the center Check out the reflection of my uh, 
fingerprint on the bottom of that cutter from the 600 grit wheel. It really leaves a nice edge. Very important on carbide, get a nice un relatively unchipped edge quality. I'll show you a little feature here. You've got your uh, in feed here on the D-bit grinder which is your main rail uh, feed and this is uh, calibrated. Um, it is from the factory and it also is on mine where I modified it. So I know what this means. This is 50 thousandths per turn. But you can't move this dot and this dial. This dial doesn't isn't re-zeroable. So what I can do is since this has also has the spindle feed where you can actually feel feed the wheel spindle itself in with a lock right here. This allows me to zero this dial and then come in and touch here on the outside edge of the tool you in feeding with the spindle and then locking it. So it's a way of getting a zero even though my main dial isn't zeroable. An important note in all this is after preaching to you about using this wheel so that it cuts right here on the outside edge as is going to be the last place to cut. So all this is below that cutting zone so it's almost like a fly cutter with this being the outside edge and you're intentionally working this in here. That means it's very important if you intend to zero that you got a zero out here where that thing's just touching. So you want to be just about ready to fall off the edge right on the corner when you go to set that zero. Otherwise you're going to be off by the amount of wheel wear that this face here is below the actual cutting edge. So now you can see the uh, I did my my cut at 037. What I'm doing is I'm in feeding on the bottom and then slowly creep, creep feed grinding around like this in one pass and then stopping at my my 90 degree facet point. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in and I'm going to move in my five thousandths to be 42 on my dial back here, and I'm going to gently come in and touch the wheel right here to get my zero and I'm actually going to set my stop here so I'm resting on the stop wait till my stop hits and starts pushing me off here there we go I just came off so right there now I'm coming in and I'm gonna just come in and visually touch the side here right there then I'm going to come here and zero my indicator. So I'm just going to grab this, loosen its mounting, and bring this up here like this. And this is going to let me feed in my 047. So now I'm going to I'm going to feed in my I think I'm just going to go to 40. Uh, the insert thickness is 047, so that's only like seven thousandths away from the lip. So I'm going to stop right there. That's how deep my little secondary lip's going to be. So I'm going to stay put there. Okay, so now on this, we're going to come all the way around to the back, and I'm going to infeed where I'm clean off the part on the back side, and I'm going to. Um, Turn it on, I'm going to feed in my mount and then creep feed around.
So this should be smaller than one millimeter, which I can see here it is. And obviously the back is cut off more, so you can't go direct measurement here, but that looks like we're in the ballpark. So we'll take this out so we can take a better look at it. So here's the back side of the cutter. There's our 5,000 step in there. There's our cutting edge. See that shine on that facet? That's the actual flat facet of the cutting edge at the 12 degrees. And then we come around here to our front face that we did in the beginning. And we should be ready to roll. We'll put this in the comparator and see what the tip diameter actually is cutting at. Here we are looking in the comparator. And I've got my eighth inch diameter centered up back in the back here and then I moved over so I'm centered with the lines. We're about 18 thousandths off center here which means we're cutting about a 036 diameter here and then we've got clearance for our 047 thickness here and this rolls off meaning it stays away from the cutting edge so it won't tend to chip it. It's going to hold it down here in the base of the insert which is what we were after. Here I'm spot drilling for the insert screw. There's the spot drill for the for the insert screw. Drilling each hole manually. Lather, rinse, repeat. Little hand tap action here. This is tough stuff. This is uh, 45 Rockwell H13 tool steel. So uh, these OSG taps are up, up to the task, but nice and slow and gentle is uh, doesn't hurt. And obviously, there's very short distance to to tap there. And I'm just going to keep this close to keep the top from wobbling around as I back out. There we are. Going to mill out now with the D bit cutter. It's going to put the 15 degree walls in the step and skim the bottom again. I've already adjusted the uh, tool diameter to get a good seat of this pocket 
and this is where I was talking about making sure that the screw pushed back into the seat and seated, putting pressure on there. Uh, the 5,000s offset I do is a little bit too much, so I had to cut the pocket a little deeper. It doesn't, it doesn't actually hurt anything. It doesn't, doesn't change anything at all. But um, this is seating well. It's able to tighten to the bottom. The inserts sit in on the bottom. And uh, one important thing to do when you're doing these is to deburr the bottom edges of these inserts because what can happen is they're dead sharp and they can actually get a bite on the wall if they're sitting above and you got to push them down and you end up snapping the insert because the insert's actually chewing the wall. So I break the edges on these such that they can't do that and uh, make sure that it seats properly. It's a, something that could bite you in the butt if you're not aware of it. This front has excess on it and we're going to grind the relief and the back five degree angle on it on the D-bit grinder. We have uh, in this direction the back tilt we have the five degrees and then we have also the rotationally five degrees past square this way to put the correct angle on. And we have a CBN wheel on. What we're looking for here is right there that seat that this is flush at that corner and um, it's hard to do uh, me hold that and film at the same time but trust me this is flush so this is not interfering with the cutting lip but this is only five degrees this is effective 12 degrees on the actual cutting edge so now I'll just in feed to my same reading since everything's repeatable here in feeding on the inside That's it. Now's a really good time to say to yourself, self, did I really do every operation that required the uh, repeatable positioning because I'm getting ready to take the screw out and do the machining on the back? And as far as I can tell, I have. But just as a general principle, always good to count your parts when you're doing multiples because sometimes you miss one and then you move on to your next operation and it's like, ah. So we're popping the uh, set screw out now. We're done with it. And we're going to machine off the excess. We're going to machine the hex down and we're going to machine the length to the correct length. That's it. That's what we need on there. So now we will um, do all these. Just want to reiterate that one of the big things of this video is the whole process of design where you think ahead to the machining processes and do things unusual like adding material or uh, you know, doing them in doubles and then parting them in half when they're done and different things like that. Thinking ahead, don't think just the part. Think process through, through the entire thing. So I just want to make sure that didn't fall through the cracks, that, that if we had started with this piece here, things would be very different. And just that simple uh, thing of starting with this mounting system design in mind made this very, very easy. I have my D-bit cutter in here that I mentioned before that has the 22 and a half degree uh, taper on the side. And I've zeroed the tip on the end here. And I've also gone over in the comparator and measured what the effective diameter of this lip is uh, so that I can know where to go because I'm, I'm holding this in my uh, drill chuck, which I know uh, the, the offsets where that's on center. So I can just move off center the amount required since I know the tip dimension of this. I know how far I can move off center and I also know how much I can go backwards behind center um, to face off the bottom as much as possible before I bump the back side. Hope that makes sense. Uh, so the comparator is a really handy tool. So I'm going to put coolant on here. I'm going to get lined up at my 042 off to the side. 
and I'm just going to uh, plunge in. the other way. And just like that, we now have our part. You can see the little bit of the uh, thread engaged there, or the, the tap was. It's not a big deal. Remember, we're just silver soldering this, so that's perfect. That's what we want for our mount to the um, uh, carbide. So now we'll just put these in, lather, rinse, repeat. Something that might be missed here if I don't actually say it out loud is that D bit just made something that could have been a lot of operations a whole lot easier. Since it cuts on center, height wise, you can plunge in like it did. So it's removing material like a flat bottom drill and yet putting this, the shape in at the same time. So, uh, I just didn't want that miss that that D bit uh, isn't just a uh, uh, another way to do it. It's a very efficient way to do it. Here I've ground the end back on the original to get large enough that it will clean up when I do the shallower taper. Here I'm set up at 45 degrees just to knock a little chamfer on the back edge of the bars. There's a nice chamfer on there just so it doesn't get cut by the uh, tail end of the carbide. Here I've set up at my 22 and a half degrees and I'm going to blast off a significant amount of material just to get my general taper adjusted. What you saw me doing there with the very heavy infeed and then a very slow rotation like this is basically a form of rotary creep feed grinding. It gives a larger contact patch for all the diamonds to work on so that a larger uh, area of diamond wheel is taking the loading that you're doing. Now there's a happy medium there. You go too much and you've got too much engaged pressure, too much rub and a lot of heat. Uh, but it's better than just little teeny in feeds where almost just a single line of particles at a time is taking the cutting loads. So it's very effective for removing a lot of material quickly. So what I'm doing here is I'm just checking before I get too far down, I'm checking and seeing how the taper fits. And I can definitely see since this outer edge here is staying put and I've got this rock, I know that my taper uh, needs to get shallower. My included angle here needs to uh, decrease. So I made a couple tweaks to the, my angle here, a couple tries, and I've got it now where I'm getting it, no no rock. Uh, I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's plenty good enough for silver soldering. It's, there's no play there. Very important when silver soldering carbide to get rid of the oxide layer. See this dark brown here, and then this where I've taken this very coarse diamond file and scuffed off that oxide and also scuffed off the uh, where I ground to get a coarser, uh, uh, groovier finish um, to get the mechanical tooth on the carbide. That helps. This dead smooth polished surface um, doesn't help uh, for the silver solder to wet as well and get as much uh, surface area to, to get a bond on. So very important to get rid of that oxide.
even the machine pieces you can see the part here on the left I have scuffed up with a diamond uh, burr or diamond mandrel with uh, at very slow speed just to get rid of that glazy smooth surface there you can see the difference in the reflection here this has n not hardly any mechanical tooth this has a lot and uh, the silver solder will wet better so I'm putting a coolant hole in the uh, two of the heads to go on the bar that has the coolant hole and the carbide and I've lined up I've got the drill centered so it doesn't move laterally when I go down into that uh, radius of that hole at the bottom and I'm using the carbide circuit board drill right now just to spot with and I'll take it out and use a high speed drill uh, to go through until I poke out the, the back and I'm intentionally not lining up with the hole in the carbide bar because the chips had a tendency to run down in there and pack the hole up full of these real fine little chips and they were a real bear to get out so I'm going to spot this now with the carbide I just wanted to get enough there to uh, to get a spot for the drill to start into because the carbide drills do not like breaking through an irregular uh, face on the opposite side and I don't want to be uh, I mean worst case I just use it on a one that doesn't have a coolant hole but uh, now I'll go through and I'll drill this with the um, high speed drill So there's our coolant hole. It's above the insert, but as you can see, the axis that I formed here, I'm actually into where the insert body is. So the coolant is actually going to shoot down onto the top of the insert and blow off the edge. So I actually had some thought about what, how I was angling this thing. So I'm now going to do another one and uh, we'll carry on. So here you can see how I have this hole angled downhill. So it's above the back of the insert, but pointing down cutting right through the face of the insert so it should spray off the face of that well it's going around the screw but should should be pretty good and then uh, this comes through in the back and is not lined up directly with the center hole and I'm just going to put a notch in the carbide to let that coolant go from the end, from the hole up to here to get into this into this hole here's another shot of what I'm talking about of how that hole I'm oriented with the axis of that hole. The hole is actually shooting down into the face of the insert. And uh, I just use the back of that hole to line up laterally to kind of guide the drill. Putting a 
a uh, like a 67 thousandths diameter hole in the bottom as a place to put a piece of 16th silver solder into the joint into that hole to be able to wick in as soon as it gets up to temperature so that I'm not trying to add silver solder from some other place so this will control the amount of silver solder and it should wick in nicely and I'll be able to add a little more at that hole if I need to some might be thinking hey you said to think about everything that you needed to do to all the pieces before you got rid of the uh, set screw system and the issue there is is that this is where the set screw uh, tip was so that's why I had to wait till now to do it so I'm using my trusty safety sill 56 it's the highest capillary action fluidity silver solder and lowest melting temperature of the hard silver solders and I'm using these trashed uh, stripping pliers to be able to cut these off without leaving a huge burr where a regular pair of uh, cutters would smash the ends and not allow it to go into the hole. This keeps it round enough to drop into that 067 hole uh, to fit properly. So what I was doing there was making this pocket that fits this contour that's going to be part of the heat sink to keep us from tempering back the pocket. So here's the two pieces. I've got them clamped together here with a piece of uh, brass shim stock parallel clamps. I've got this set where this can come in and go like this. I'll just put a second clamp here and this is going to be our heat sink area to keep the seat from getting tempered back. Now I'm going to grind a clearance around this in the belt sander, just eyeball. We have our soldering heat sink grabbed in the vise. We have our part in there. We have our secondary clamp that's actually applying the gripping force up here at the top. We have the uh, heat sink sprayed with boron nitride uh, spray it's a good mask to keep things from brazing uh, if you've done any silver soldering you uh, won't be long before you silver solder something to your heat sink so this stuff uh, ZYP uh, coatings sells this it's expensive but it works really well in this application I've also uh, uh, swiveled this in the vise until I have this alignment so this, this is level in both directions because I'm going to be using just a weight to hold this thing in place like this. Without that, uh, this would just pop, hop out of there from the um, boiling of the flux and it would just push it right out and fall over. And uh, It's never happened to me, but I've, I've seen people do it. So uh, that's why we're doing the, uh, the weight and having it nice and level. Now we're going to take our uh, high temperature black flux, Harris, and uh, get this wetted inside here and get this covered put this in get the camera out of the way so it's not keeping this from getting in place roll this around to uh, break up the the uh, particles of the flux so that this can actually seat and we're going to come back here on the back side and push our little silver solder plug in with the uh, tweezers this is what's going to feed the joint with silver solder always a good thing to have the silver solder in the joint if you can or uh, a line to flow into the joint now that will blow right out of there if I don't hold it in place once I get warming this up so I'm gonna have to do that once I get the uh, torch fired up and uh, we're gonna flow this Okay, let's see if we can do this without melting the camera. I'll hold my silver solder in here. I'm going to warm this up gently. You always want to give your flux time to evaporate, the, the water to evaporate out gently. You don't want to just fry it. Slow and steady wins the race. Remember, we're trying to warm the part, not the heat sink. But it's very close, so we've got to be careful to not 
I got to get enough heat in there that I make sure that it actually flows. Remember, one of the signs that your temperature is good is when the flux turns clear. I'm feeling the solder moving so I know that it's starting to flow. I'm going to back off now and just worry about my heat. Trying to keep my heat right down here on the section where it matters. There we go. You saw that pop up to the top edge there. Now it doesn't mean quit there. You need to maintain temperature for a little bit to make sure that that temperature gets all the way to the center. You go and stop as soon as you see that first sign of, of, of uh, flow, you can end up in trouble. And I just see that I lost some of my, uh, I lost my solder in the back here, so I'm going to uh, give that a, Make sure we had this. Yeah. There we go. So, make sure this is good and good and flowed here. Just a dull, a dull cherry. This only takes about just about barely 1,200 degrees to flow, and then I'm going to back away slowly. I don't want the the heat sink to suck the, the temperature out too rapidly. And I think we got a winner there. Probably a darn good thing we've got the uh, boron nitride on there or that probably would have been soldered to the fixture. So you can see we've got good flow there. You notice this did not get high temperature. This stayed well below the uh, probably, I don't know, maybe even, probably only been 800 degrees or so. You can see here where the actual solder would wanted to flow down in, but it was stopped by the uh, uh, boron nitride. So it was a good thing I put it on there in this particular case. So now it's time to uh, grind the heads of these. And miracle of all miracles, I managed to solder the one with the coolant hole without soldering the coolant hole shut. You can see the nice flow of this sucking into the to the uh, from the feed hole. That that feed from the inside is very important. I can't stress enough how having the solder in the joint is just a, a good way to not have problems. So I've got the heat sink with its shim, the uh, three extra heads, and the silver solder slugs are all in there ready for either replacing smashed heads on the ones I just did or uh, making extra bars. Now I'm going to grind the uh, head down until it cleans up. See what the diameter is. I'm going to leave this about, uh, hopefully, about 260. Take another three thousandths off there, and we're good. There you have it, that's 260, and I'm going to leave that as is. Uh, I'm not really worried about having clearance for exactly a quarter of an inch. So there it is. 
good to do a little uh, abrasive uh, brush action on it and then glass bead and we're done. Here's the real magic is the uh, fine abrasive crystal brush. This trick works nicely for protecting uh, threads as long as the toothpick fits. <laughs> but I've used uh, bamboo skewers also, uh, also work. Protects the hole from getting beat up when I'm glass beading, so I'm just threading this in firmly like that, and that will mask the hole uh, as I glass bead these, and I can just unscrew it and take it out. Sometimes it's hard to get glass bead residue out of tapped holes. They're always crunchy afterwards, so I like to do this. I know, glass beading is cheating. It makes anything look good. And you just unscrew these. Threads are protected. I'll ultrasonic clean these. And on these, I will clean up the shanks a little bit. There you go. So here's the finished product. Going hole. We've got our seats with our relieved edge so we don't break the edge of the insert. Both cases. Silver solder. We're ready to assemble. I've already got blue molly on my uh, screw. Seated down nice. Looking good. Let's go check out the uh, coolant flow. There's the coolant flow with just a trickle. And as I bump up the pressure here, you can see that that's spraying really good on the hitting the top of the insert and flaring out. So that's that's what I was trying to achieve. It it worked pretty well, considering the screw is still there. Well, if you made it this far, I hope you enjoyed it and found it educational or helpful. That was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed making those, and um, the uh, probably took me about six, seven hours of uh, time of actual production time. Most of it was filming time. So um, when you consider there's six of them here, um, and figure out whatever shop hourly rate you want to use, it's not a bad deal. Uh, and obviously it's not necessarily the most practical thing to do, but the quality of these is much higher than what I bought. So there was a good reason for me to uh, tackle these and, and make some, some decent ones. And it's just, uh, it's just a very enjoyable project. So uh, thank you all my Patreon and PayPal supporters. Like I always say, it's not expected, but it is appreciated. If at any time you think my content product, production uh, rate is uh, subpar and isn't worth supporting, don't hesitate. I'm not going to think any worse of anyone who backs out and says, hey, that guy's not making enough videos. Not a problem at all. Um, like I said, I do this because I want to uh, um, spread the, spread the uh, knowledge and um, give back to the uh, occupation that I, uh, I just really love. So um, I'm doing it more for fun. Uh, so hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back.